All right, grab your Bible, open up to 1 Timothy chapter 2. We'll be there. Several other places in Scripture we're going to be this morning. 1 Timothy chapter 2, you need to open up. Different ages along the way have different significance. Some birthdays are more important than others. I think sometimes when somebody turns 20, now that's so long ago for me I can't even remember, but when, when people turn 20, they kind of feel funny because they were in the single digits and then they were teens and then they cross over 20 and they think, oh my goodness, I'm supposed to act like a grown-up now, you know, kind of a rude awakening. Some ladies, when they hit 30, uh, they don't like that for some reason or another. Uh, hit 50, that's half a hundred and you start thinking, wow, you know, i Moving up there, 65, you start getting Medicare. That's pretty significant. <laughs> and then uh, 90 or 100, I mean, he really lived a while. So different ages are more significant than others. But this morning, 243. We celebrate our nation this week, Two hundred. And 43 years. Now, you have to appreciate history. Lots of nations do not make 243 years. I mean, the Babylonian Empire that we read about in the Old Testament, that was just a few decades, the Second Babylonian Empire, just a few decades. Nations rise, nations fall. And so, as we celebrate 243, seven years away from 250, you remember the 200th, don't you? Well, it's coming up on... 250. And so how do we celebrate that? Well, um, we uh, wear red, white, and blue. I tried to be a little patriotic this morning. We go out tonight and, and pop some fireworks and have a big time together. Nothing wrong with that. And I hope you can come and we'll have a great time of fellowship celebrating our country. Uh, some people eat too much. Some people drink way too much. Those are probably not good ways. But this morning, we will see some biblical ways that you and I as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm assuming you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is vacation week. All people are all on vacation and you chose to be here. So how do we as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ really respond to this country in the appropriate way. I want to list four things this morning. I've got them even written for you. I don't normally do this, but we're looking at three little snippets and then one passage. And so I just printed them for you and you can see those right there in your sermon notes and don't expect it next week, but that <clears throat> that's this morning. <laughs> How do we respond? We, everything we do, we want to do as unto the Lord. And so how do we celebrate this country. Number one, we give thanks. We give thanks for our nation. First Thessalonians 5.18 says, In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you. People are always wanting to know what's God's will. Should I take this job? Should I go to that school? You know, what should I do? Should I marry this person? What's God's will? Well, before we ever get to those questions, God has told us some things that are in his will. And if we will do the things that are in his will, then those other questions down the line are going to be easier when we are already following the will of God. Now, folks, here is the will of God, that we be a thankful people. Too many times we can be grumblers and gripers, but the Bible says we should be thankful there's so many spiritual things to be thankful for. Folks, listen, Jesus died on the cross and rose for you so that you could be reconciled to God, so that you could be redeemed, so you could be adopted into his family, so your sins could be forgiven. You would be justified in his sight. I mean, what an incredible thing. We are thankful to God for that. And we're thankful to God for our families. I thank God for my wife. This summer, she has put up with me for 35 years. Okay. So she deserves a medal. We're thankful. We're thankful that we get up this morning and we had a car that would get us to church and we had breakfast on the table if we wanted to eat it. And, and we're just thankful. But we need to be thankful for our country. 
Now, some people want to live here, but they're not very thankful. Have you been keeping up with the women's soccer team, the national women's soccer team, and there's one lady on it that she won't sing the national anthem? And, and my thinking is, okay, look, if you don't want to sing, why are you on the nation's team if you don't want to sing the national I don't understand that. But she don't want to. She, you know, too many bad things about our country. Well, folks, there are some bad things about our country. There always have been with every country. We have a history. We had slavery and we had racism and we didn't treat the Indians all that great. And, you know, we've had some corruption and... I mean, we're not a perfect nation. You know why? Because it's made up of people. And the Bible teaches us, if we Christians know anything, we ought to know this. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So every person is imperfect. And if you put a bunch of imperfect people together, what have you got? You've got an imperfect nation. Every nation is imperfect. But some are a whole lot better than others, and some are a whole lot worse than others. And we're blessed to be living in this one. I mean, think about this nation founded on Judeo-Christian principles. Now, we're forgetting them, but we were founded on it. We have the freedom to come to church if we want to, or not to come if you don't want to, or any church you want to. You have freedom. We have a land of plenty and prosperity, even so much that we share it around the world. Whenever there's a tragedy anywhere in the world, the people that are always quickest to hand out something and help are Americans. We have prosperity. We have plenty. We share that. We've sent our young men and our young women off to take care of horrible things around the world. My grandfather went off to fought in World War II in the Battle of the Bulge and so that Hitler could be taken down and thousands and thousands of Jewish people could be released before they killed them in the concentration camps. I mean, our, our country's done a lot for the world. We have not been perfect. But one of the best things we've done, we have sent missionaries all over the world. England and the United States in the 17, the 1800s, sent the gospel out all over the world so people can know Jesus Christ. So no, we are not a perfect nation, and we need to work on the imperfections, and we're going to talk about that later on. But we need to be so thankful to God. And we need to take a moment and stop, and Russ was talking about that. We just need to be thankful to God for what we have, and that's the will of God. Give thanks. For this is God's will. Can we just stop right now and just do that? Let's bow your heads right now. We're not, I'm not through with the sermon. But just stop right now and just say thank you to God. Close your eyes. Thank you to God for this nation that we live in. Thank Him for the blessings. Thank you, Lord God. Help us to be appreciative. Help us to be a grateful people. And we do pray in Jesus' name. We give thanks. We also give honor. We give honor to our nation, to its leaders. If you read Romans 13 and 1 Peter 2, that middle paragraph, you're going to read about how God sets up government. God is a God of order, and he does not like chaos. And when you get a bunch of people together, you can quickly have chaos, and God knows that. And he knows that if he just leaves evil unchecked, evil will spread, and it'll get a lot worse. And so God set up, first of all, the family, and last he set up the church, but in the middle, he set up government. And government is set up, the Bible says, to punish evil and to praise that which is good. That's what the government is supposed to do. The government is to maintain order. And so therefore, Romans 13 says, we are to submit ourselves to the government that God has set up. God sets up government. And folks, almost any government is better than no government at all. Have you ever seen where law and order break down? That is a horrible, horrible thing. So God sets up government, and when he sets it up, he expects us to honor that government. And in our country, as much as anywhere in the world, 
it is easy to respect it. No, not perfect. But we are to honor that government. He says we're to submit ourselves to every human institution for the Lord's sake. He says in 1 Peter chapter 2, this is God's will. We always already saw it's God's will for us to be thankful. It is also God's will for us to honor the governing authorities that are over us. 1 Peter 2.17 says this, fear God, that's the beginning of wisdom, fear God and honor the king. Now we don't have a king, but we do have authorities that are over us, and we are to honor them. We have a president. You may or may not have voted for him, but you don't call him Donald. I've seen reporters uh, treat the president in horrible ways. That is not their place. We are to honor the office. Whether or not you like the man, we honor the office. And we don't say Donald, we say Mr. President. And someday we may say Mrs. President, I don't know, but right now we say Mr. President. We go into a courtroom, and we don't sit there slouching as the judge comes in. What do they say when the judge comes in? All rise. Why do we do that? Because that man is so important? No, because his office is so important. He represents the government. He represents justice. And when, that, when he comes into the room representing all that, we stand in honor of that. We honor The president, we honor the judge. When the policeman pulls you over, and I hope he doesn't have to, okay? We have a lot of law enforcement officers in our church, and we appreciate them. You're safer right now because some of them are seated in this room. We have a lot of them. If they have to pull you over because you were carelessly going too fast or whatever, you don't start barking. You say, Yes, sir, officer, how can I help you? Because you respect the law and the order and the government that they represent. And so one of the things we do is we want to honor our country today. We give thanks for it, but also we say, how can I be a better citizen? How can I be a more law-abiding citizen? How can I honor this government that God has put above me to keep it from being a riot, to keep it from being mob rule, from, from... Keep it from just being the survival of the fittest and the strongest. How can I honor it? Give thanks. Give honor. And third, pray. Pray. We pray for our nation. First Timothy chapter 2. This was last year's 4th of July text. I'm going to go back to it. And maybe every year till Jesus comes because... We need to pray for our country. Timothy writes this. First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men for kings and all who are in authority so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. We give thanks to God. We give honor to the government that he has established. And we pray for our nation. Now look what he says in verse 1. He says, first of all, I urge that entreaties and prayers and petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men. And so it is the will of God that we go through life giving lifting up prayers for people. And when you go into the bank and there's a teller there taking care of you, you're polite to them because you're a Christian, and maybe you also just whisper a little prayer. Sometimes when I'm having a meal and, I, and the waiter or the waitress will come and they'll say, how can we help you? And, and I'm gonna, we're going to pray. And so I'll sometimes say, well, what can we pray for you about? And sometimes it just takes them off guard, but sometimes they'll get kind of teary-eyed and say, uh, you know, my, my daughter's having a problem or whatever. You pray for people. You're going down the street. You see somebody out there, they're having a hard time. They're hitchhiking or whatever. Maybe you don't pick them up, but you can at least pray for them. 
you pray for people, all people, it says. And then it says, not only all men, but very specifically it says in verse 2, for kings and all who are in authority. So God has allowed some people to be in authority, and our responsibility is to honor their office and also to pray for them. Now, strangely enough, when Paul wrote this, New Testament scholars tell us they've got the year pretty well pinned down, and they know who the emperor was, and you know who it was? It was Nero. You may not have liked some of the presidents we've had, but Nero was a thousand times worse than the worst president we've ever even thought about. I mean, he was doing horrible things to Christians for a brief period. Yet Paul said, under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, he said he is the king and we are to pray for him. And folks, if that's true for Nero, how much more true is it for us today? That we should pray for our leaders. We gripe about them. You know, that's like a national pastime. We get together and we talk about how, what a horrible job they're doing or whatever. Our job is to pray for them. For President Trump whether or not you voted for him. For President Obama, whether or not you voted for him. President Bush, President Clinton, on down the line, for every one of them, whether we voted for them or not, they were the presidents, and we are to pray for them. And now we have one in office, and we're to pray for him. That is what God has told us to do. We've got a vice president, Mike Pence. We're to pray for him. He presides over the Senate. We've got a Speaker of the House really close to sitting in the Oval Office should a couple of tragedies take place. We need to pray for her. We've got uh, Supreme Court justices that are so important in our day, probably in our day, probably more important than any time in history because so much is passed off to them. We need to pray for our Supreme Court justices. We need to pray for our governor, Governor Abbott, our local leaders, school board members. When your kids are at a certain school, we're to pray for those people because the, the decisions they make will affect us. So we need to pray. And we need to learn how to pray for our leaders. For example, when you think about it, when the news comes on and you see the president, you can pray for him. Oh, Lord God, help him. Lord, deliver him from evil. Don't let him do anything that's evil. Help him to make decisions that are wonderful when he doesn't even know he's making wonderful decisions. Lord God, help him to be open to hear your voice and not the voice of the people or his own opinion. Help him to listen to you. Lord God, we pray for him and the vice president and the Congress and the Supreme Court justices and the governor and on down the line. And we pray for them. Some people have given up voting. They say, oh, my vote is just one in a bunch of millions. My voice is just one in a bunch of millions. I'm not even going to mess with that anymore. And I think that's a poor decision. But some people have gotten to that place. But here's something, folks, we know. You may not think your vote counts. You may not think your voice is heard. But listen, your prayers are heard in heaven. By the all-powerful God, we think the president is powerful. He's nothing compared to our God, who is King of kings and Lord of lords, who rules and reigns over all. The Bible says the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. Like rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. And you and I as believers in Christ, we go to God in prayer. And you may not think your vote is heard or your voice is heard, but your prayer is heard, and you lift up your prayers to God. The Bible says, as God was speaking to his Old Testament people, and he was saying, if you get in trouble, he says, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then he said, I will hear from heaven and heal their land. And we said a little while ago, that we want to thank God for our nation, but it's not perfect. And there's some things that need to be healed. And so what do we do? One of the things we do is we pray. 
And we go to God and we ask him, the great physician, Lord, would you heal some things in our land that desperately need to be healed? And so as the fireworks are going off and they're exploding in midair and you're ooing and eyeing and you're enjoying that and your eyes are turned up to heaven, also lift up a prayer for our country. Lord God, would you send spiritual explosions to blow up all over our nation? Would you turn this nation around and back to you? Lord God, we are lifting it up to you. We give thanks. We give honor to God. We pray and then the fourth and final thing is this we use our christian influence matthew chapter 5 first chapter of the sermon on the mount in matthew chapter 5 jesus begins to give the beatitudes blessed are the poor in spirit blessed are the peacemakers etc then right after that he says and now i want you to be world changers he didn't use that language, but he said, I want you to be salt and light. He says to his followers, and that's us, he says to his followers, you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world. You are to make a difference in the world. You are difference makers. You have influence, and you should use it to make your country a better place. He said, you are the salt of the earth. Now, salt is cheap for us. You go down to the store, you can buy a bunch of salt, really cheap. But in those days, salt was incredibly valuable. Matter of fact, Roman soldiers were sometimes paid in salt. You know the old expression, you're not worth your salt? Okay. They were paid in salt. The word salary actually comes from the Latin word for salt. So salt was important. It was used for many, many things. One of the main things it was used for was to retard spoilage. You go down and slaughter uh, a steer, they did not have refrigerators. <laughs> they did not have deep freeze. And so they got all this meat. What are they going to do with it? Well, they salted it. And it kept it from decaying, or at least it slowed down the decaying process. They salted it. Salt was very, very valuable. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. What is he saying? One of the things we Christians are to do is we're to slow down the decaying process. God set up a world that didn't decay. Adam and Eve lived in a paradise. They were not ever going to get old. They messed it up. And since sin entered the world and corruption and death through sin, the world is decaying. God's going to fix it all someday. But right now, the world is decaying. But when God tells believers, you are the salt of the earth, what he's saying is, I want you to put on the brakes of this downhill run. We're trying to move away from God. And God says, you're the salt. You stop the decay. You put your foot on the brakes and slow this thing down. And that's part of our job. Have you no noticed that the world out there is not headed in the right direction a lot of times? You, you've noticed that. Sometimes it seems like we're trying to take this wonderful country that God has given us and that we're trying to drive it off a cliff. And that some people have got their foot on the accelerator to drive it off the cliff. And God says, you are salt. So by the grace of God, we put our foot on the brakes. And we're trying to slow this thing down. We don't want it headed off that cliff. That's part of our job. Now, that does not mean that we go around shaking our fist in everybody's face all the time. That does not mean that we're yelling and screaming. But, folks, you have an influence in this world. You are salt. And you are to be used of God to kind of slow down some of the horrible things that is happening. It can be done in a lot of different ways. And we just 
talked about prayer. That's an incredibly important way. But there are other ways as well. Sometimes when there's something going on at the office and everybody's talking about something and that conversation is going totally the wrong way, sometimes you can say, well, you know, have you thought about it in this way? You try to turn things just a little bit. You try to be salt. Everybody's doing something. They're all maybe telling horrible jokes or whatever in your circle that you happen to be in. And you just stop right there and you say, wait a minute, let me tell you something that happened. And you just change the conversation because you're salt. You use your influence in this country. The nation is only a conglomeration of people. And if all those people are trying to decay things, it just gets worse and worse. But if some of us are trying to be salt, we can slow that down. God says you are the salt of the earth. He also says you are the light of the world. Your salt and your light. The Bible says Jesus is the light of the world. When people reject Jesus, darkness increases. But now that Jesus has ascended to heaven, he says, you are the light of the world, and we reflect his light. And when we receive him as Savior and we try to live for him, we're reflecting his light. And just like you don't want to keep salt in the salt shaker, you want to get it out there. You don't want to hide light, and you want light to shine. And that's what he's called us to do. We may be in a dark place, but we're to be like light and where to shine. And you know what? Darkness doesn't always like the light. Men love darkness, the Bible says, rather than light. But we are still to shine our lights so it makes a difference in the world. So what are we doing? He said, you are salt and light. You are slowing down the decay. You are f- stepping up. You're trying to dispel the darkness. And you're making a difference in the world. And we're to let our influence have an impact on this world. Do you remember the story of Abraham? And Abraham had separated from Lot because their herdsmen were fighting and Lot had gone off to live. And the Bible says he pitched his tents toward Sodom and ultimately wound up living there. A horrible mistake. God came down and he was on his way to destroy Sodom. And he told Abraham what he was going to do. And Abraham interceded. And he said, oh Lord God, if you would find 50, and then he said 40, and then he keeps going down. And he said, if you would just find 10 righteous men in Sodom, would you spare it for the sake of those 10? And God said, I will. And I've often wondered what percentage that was. Were there a hundred men in Sodom and ten were ten percent? Or were there a thousand and ten were one percent? But whatever it was, God said for them, I will spare it. And sometimes I look at churches and I look at our nation. We've done some horrible things in the last few years. Made some horrible mistakes. And I look down at our nation and I look at it, Christians, and I say, I wonder if we are part of the percentage, whatever it is, that holds back the hand of God from judgment. Because we are trying to love the Lord Jesus Christ. We're trying to be salt and light in our world. And I wonder if God looks down on our nation and says, I blessed it, I blessed it, I blessed it. So many of them have turned their back on me. But for the sake of these... I'll hold off judgment just a little bit longer. Salt and light. So what are we supposed to do? We are to give thanks. Lord God, what a history we've had. Thank you. We're to give honor. Think about that this week. How can I honor the authorities that God has set up over me? We are to pray. And we are to be salt and light in a decaying and a dark world. Salt and light. We're to do that. So that hopefully we can have some more birthdays. In seven years, 
if this nation is granted seven more years by the all-powerful God, we'll be 250 years old. In 57 years, 300. But folks, listen. We cannot have another 57 years like the past 57 years. There's been a lot of good. But there have been some horrible things. In the last 57 years, we have aborted about 60 million little babies. We have said, God, we know better than you. And now God's marriage is not one man, one woman for one lifetime. Marriage is whoever wants to marry whoever for however little amount of time. And we've tried to rewrite the rules. We've said, God, we think we're pretty smart. And we think we can do it without you. But God said, you are driving that bus off the cliff. And we can't take another 57 like the past 57. And so we ask God, Lord God, would you turn this around? And would you help us to be salt and light and make a difference in this nation? For the sake of our children, for the sake of our grandchildren, oh Lord God, let us make a difference. Let's bow our heads, please, all over this place. Our God has blessed us so much, and we want to honor Him in return. We want to be the people that He wants us to be, and we make up the nation that He wants us to be. He has blessed us so much, we want to appreciate what He has done. So this morning, with heads bowed and eyes closed, thank God. Thank God for every good thing. Honor Him for giving us this nation. Pray for the things that need to be turned around. And there's a bunch. And then ask God to make you salt and light. Lord God, help me to be salty. To make a difference in my world, my family, my job. Help me to be light when everybody else is trying to turn the lights off. Help me to be light. Thank you, God. We've enjoyed what we've had, but we want to pass it on to the future generations. Father, uh, this is a salt shaker. And there's salt in this room. And we pray that we can go out of this room, we can spread that salt, and we can slow down decay. There's light in this room, Lord God. We're like a candle. We're like a city on a hill. We're not to be hidden. Help us to go out of this place and spread some light. Lord, help us to always do it with a spirit-filled attitude, with a loving heart. Help us to do it. But, Lord, help us to be salt and to be light. We honor you, Lord God. We thank you that you rule and reign, whether nations rise or whether nations fall. You are king of kings forever, and we honor you for that. And we're thankful that ultimately our citizenship is in heaven, and we know where our home is. But, Lord, we do not want to trash this home that we have down here. And so we pray we'll be the people you want us to be. We lift all of this up. In the glorious name of our crucified and resurrected Lord Jesus.